Hello, everyone. We're almost at the top of the hour, so we're just going to give it one more minute for some more people to join us. But I wanted to say hello and welcome. So just hang in there. We're going to start uh, right at eight o'clock. Okay, there we are. I think it's about eight o'clock now. We can get started. Welcome, everyone, to our phonological awareness webinar tonight. We have with us our facilitator that we've welcomed for the last um, webinar as well, Carolyn Erdus. So she's a speech language pathologist and is the coordinator of speech and language pathology at Sir Wilfrid Laurier Board and SLP advisor for the Speech and Language Audiology Canada. Previously, she was the advancing Learning Differentiation and Inclusion Coordinator for the 10 English School Boards in Quebec, where she supported resource teachers through the various professional development initiatives. With over 20 years experience as pediatric SLP, her areas of expertise include bimultilingualism, reading and language disorder, FASD, and craniofacial differences. Carolyn has lectured at several Canadian universities. She's also been invited to present at numerous world conferences across North America and has written and collaborated on several publications. So welcome everyone. I wanted to just do that little intro. Some of you are familiar with Carolyn because we had welcomed her before on the last webinar that we did on speech and language. And so welcome again to all of you who are joining us for this second one or for some of you who are just joining us for this one. Uh, what I wanted to mention was that you are all in listen mode, but that doesn't mean you won't be having an opportunity to ask some questions or, or post some comments. So if you'd like to put that in the questions, I will be monitoring those throughout the webinar. As well, I know many of you are interested in the certificates. So to let you know, we will be sending out a follow-up webinar, which will have the slide presentation contained in it, as well as a brief survey. And we will also have, um, the certificates that will be coming out in a separate email after the event. So usually give us a couple of days to do that. So by the end of the week, we should have those certificates out to you as well as the follow-up email. And I would also like to thank um, Wintergreen Learning Materials who has been generous enough to offer some support uh, to sponsor these professional development webinars. So I'm going to turn it over to Suzanne, our colleague Suzanne here at the Canadian Child Care Federation, who's going to do our land acknowledgement this evening. So over to you, Suzanne. Thank you, Robin. We respectfully acknowledge that the land on which the CCCF is located is the tr traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. We recognize all Indigenous people who were here before us, those who live with us now and the seven generations to come. As Indigenous people have done since time immemorial, we strive to be responsible stewards of the land and to respect the cultures, ceremonies, and traditions of all who call it home. As we open our hearts and minds to the past, we commit ourselves to working in a spirit of truth and reconciliation to make a better future for all. Today, these lands continue to be shared territory and are occupied by many diverse peoples from near and far. A treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and dedicate ourselves to move forward in a partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Thank you, Suzanne. So over to you, Carolyn. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I'm super excited to be presenting on this topic today and to pre be presenting to you early childhood educators because you play such an important role in terms of getting children ready and strong from a language perspective that I find it exciting to work with you and to be able to share with you the high leverage types of activities that you may already be doing or that you will start doing if this interests you, to further boost children's language skills. Today's topic is phonological awareness. So this is something that most people have heard about, certainly um, in schools, everyone has heard about phonological awareness, but there's a lot of 
terminology around phonological awareness, and it's not that clear generally, uh, even for for teachers in schools. So I'm I'm happy to have an opportunity to to review this information with you. So the content of tonight's session is as follows. We're going to start with some definitions uh, because, as I said, there's a lot of terminology. We're going to look at um, the link between phonological awareness and reading and writing. Uh, it's a very important skill, and I'll explain exactly why it's such a big deal. We're going to talk about the precursors to phonological awareness. There's certain things that kids have to be able to do before we think about um, rolling out phonological awareness activities. I'll share with you the continuum of difficulty of phonological awareness. And um, my main goal is to share many, many activities with you so that you leave tonight knowing how you can <clears throat> try a few things tomorrow with your student, with your children. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so for the definitions, firstly, a syllable. When we're talking about syllables, my name is Caroline, Caroline. So it's just a group of phonemes that naturally divide a spoken word. That's what we mean by a syllable. A rhyme, R-I-M-E, is actually a linguistic thing. It's the last stressed vowel of a syllable and any consonants that follow. So, for example, in the word pup, the rhyme is the ending part, up. And it's also the part that rhymes, R-H-Y-M-E. That's um, syllables or endings of words that sound the same. A phoneme is the smallest unit of language. So it's a speech sound. The smallest speech sound of a word is called a phoneme. So in the word fish, for example, one of the phonemes is the one that is represented by the letter F. But the phoneme is the part that we hear, not the part that we write. Then we have the grapheme, and that's the part that we write. So a grapheme is either one letter or a combination of letters that represent one sound. So for example, the word night has only three phonemes. N, I, T. Those are the three sounds, the three phonemes. Um, and those are represented by these graphemes. So the N, the grapheme is the letter N. The I, the I sound, the grapheme is the letters I, G, H, that makes the I sound, and the T is the phoneme, the sound, and the grapheme is the letter T. So that's um, the difference between phoneme and grapheme. And we have phonological awareness. If you want to make sure to use the right term, use the term phonological awareness because that is the umbrella term that includes everything. And phonemic awareness is only those activities that deal with individual sounds in words. Um, and that's where there's some confusion sometimes. Phonemic awareness is the place that we're trying to get to as quickly as possible. That's our target with our little guys and our, our, our little girls in uh, daycare. Now, contrary to oral language, what's important to know is that phonological awareness is not general, generally learned incidentally. Children have to be explicitly taught. They have to practice this in order to get it. Some students, some children require more practice than others. Now I'm talking about children and students because phonological awareness is really, you'll see that the easiest of the phonological awareness tasks that I'll be talking about, most children are ready for that only around age three, that they start to be able to blend syllables. So if you're working with very young children before the age of three, this might not be applicable right now, but if you ever changed groups, or if you have children who are way ahead of the game in terms of their early skills in this area, you may need these uh, activities. Here's a visual to help clarify the terminology. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm just moving a few things out of the way here. I have the, the webinar 
uh, screen there for, for all the functions. Um, so this, you see that the umbrella term is phonological awareness, as I was saying a second ago. And underneath that, you have different abilities. So you have sentence awareness, just being able to keep track of what's a sentence. Um, that's one type of awareness. Then we have word awareness, where we, we sometimes hear people having um, children count the words in a sentence. The baby sleeps. Baby is one word. So that's, to be able to say that, that's word awareness. Then there's syllable awareness, the ability to perceive and manipulate syllables um, in words. So to say baby, for example, to, to be able to imitate and then do on their own clapping out of syllables is syllable awareness. But all of this, um, the most important part is this phonemic awareness. The baby is b, a, b. E. That's phonemic awareness, being able to identify the individual sounds in a word that you hear. And this for now is all happening auditorily. I'm not talking about paper and pencil and writing down words. This is just playing with words and parts of words that we hear. So to remember is that the other stuff, it, we don't focus on it that much. We only might use syllable awareness to help a child understand about phonemes, but we would not be teaching sentence awareness or word awareness. We would usually start at syllable awareness, and that's important to know because if you don't know that, then you'll be spending tons of time having children count words in sentences or identify sentences that you might have read or spoken out loud. And, and that's not what's going to make the biggest difference. Now, the reason why this is such a big deal, this famous phonological awareness, is because we have, from the year 2000, we have the National Reading Panel Report. That report came out of a mandate that was given to literacy experts. They were told, review all of the research that is out there in the world that is written in English and synthesize for us what it is that children need in order to learn to read and to spell well, but really primarily the focus was on reading. And these experts synthesized over 100,000 studies and they said that what children need is strong phonological awareness and strong letter knowledge. And that when they have these skills, this is a big part of what they need in order to learn to read. They also talked about other pieces like vocabulary and comprehension, but resoundingly phonological awareness and letter sound knowledge came out as being extremely important. Then the National Early Literacy Panel report in 2008 reaffirmed the importance of those skills and talked about how those are the two skills that when they are very well developed, we have children who are more likely to do well academically in terms of literacy. So we know that children who are strong in these areas succeed better. And you at the, at the daycare level have an opportunity to get in there early and to really build those skills of phonological awareness in a robust manner to better prepare um, children for the path of reading and writing. We know as well that children who have strong phonological awareness and letter sound knowledge feel better about themselves as learners and are more motivated to go to school. So it really sets the stage and sets a very solid foundation all around. Um, so uh, this is what I just shared with the reference of that. Now, when you think about phonological awareness, um, there are certain prerequisites that have to be put in place because you will soon see that we're often talking about and using words like, what's, what do you hear at the beginning of the word? What do you hear at the end of the word? Is this short? Is this long? So because we're using this type of language, we need to make sure that the children understand um, sequences, that they understand 
something comes first and something comes next. And one way to do this is, of course, with stories. So we often read stories to young children and one way to make sure that they understand these terms and that we can then use them for our phonological awareness activities is to talk about, do you remember the beginning of the story? And do you remember what happened at the end? And as you're reading a story to say, what's gonna happen next? To use these terms a lot and to ask children to manipulate this concept by doing things like maybe putting pictures in order, or maybe you have the top visual with beginning, middle, and end, and you have read the three pigs, and you're gonna say, do you remember what happened at the beginning? And when they tell you that the pig was with um, his mommy, then we're gonna sketch very roughly a pig and a mom to, to represent that beginning and to teach kids about beginning, middle, and end. So that's an important precursor, because if you ask them what sound they hear at the beginning of a word, and they get it wrong, it might be because they don't know what you mean with that word beginning. So in the big picture of things, we know um, that this is the general order of from easy to most difficult skills, and we'll be breaking those down further. Blending of syllables, children have usually mastered by um, the end of their K-4 year. In, in Quebec, we have kindergarten for four-year-olds and kindergarten for five-year-olds. So by the, a, the end of the year where they were four, they are blending and segmenting syllables. Now you can, that, that means that you can start doing these types of activities when the children are about three years of age and they, they will, for the most part, be able to start grasping that. Um, so we start by blending. That means sliding sounds together, and I'll give you detailed examples. And then the next thing to do is to have them segment, which means breaking syllables apart. Um, then we're gonna have them, once they can do that, we're gonna move on to first sound. What do you hear at the beginning of the word fish? And we're hoping that they'll say f after we've modeled it several times. Next, we're gonna have them blend sounds in words. So the word bike is b, i, k, and we're going to say those three sounds and we're going to say, can you slide those sounds together and tell me what the word is? So my word is b, i, k, and they should be saying bike. That's blending two or three sounds. Then they're going to segment two to three sounds and they can usually do that by the end of five the five, year, uh, five years of age year, they can blend and segment individual sounds in words. And then the next step, which is quite tricky, but maybe you have some five-year-olds and your five-year-old groups who can do this, is to have them blend and segment words that have consonant clusters, which means two consonants side by side, like in the word stop. So if you're wondering why some kids can, can blend things like at, but not st, op. That's because that two consonants side by side, that's very tricky. So that's another step of difficulty. So this is the general guidelines for when to expect these skills. Now there are certain things that make it easier or harder when you're, you're choosing the words that you're working with. We know that um, so I've said that the syllables and counting and blending syllables, that's easier than counting and blending individual sounds in words. We've talked about that. We know that longer words uh, are going to be harder for children than shorter words. So if I have a child tell me all the sounds in the word pop, for example, that's naturally a million times easier than Tell me all the sounds in popsicle. That's very hard to keep track of all the sounds in popsicle. That's one thing that makes the task more difficult. Another is that it's much easier to work with words that have stretchable sounds, which is why I keep using the example fish, because I can go fish to really emphasize that beginning sound. I can do the same for the end sound or the middle sound. 
But if I use a word like cat, it's hard to stretch out that k sound, right? I'd have to go k, 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 which is not ideal. So you want stretchable sounds. So words like fish, words like so, me, moon, all of these sounds that can be stretched, which are the ones on the left over here. The ones on the right are the sounds that can't be stretched. Then we have word position. It's much easier to ask a child what sound they hear at the beginning of a word than to ask them what's at the end or in the middle of a word. And then this last box here is what I've been explaining about these consonant clusters. That's quite tricky. So for your daycare group, I think that for the most part, you can stay away from those clusters unless you have a child who's not challenged enough with a simple word like cat and they need an extra little um, level of difficulty, then you can do words like fast or stop where there are two consonants side by side when we say them orally. Now, what's important is sometimes you're going to say, you might be surprised what, to hear me say that most children have syllable awareness. So you're very young, you know, well, young in my terms, where I have two adult children. Um, so three and four year olds, you might say, tell me all the syllables in the word elephant, and they'll go, elephant, four. Now, that is not a syllable awareness problem. Those children have syllable awareness because they were able to tap out the right number of syllables. Where it's breaking down is in terms of keeping track of how many and of counting as they're going. But you can consider that that, children, that child is able to count syllables. Now, if you ask them, put these two syllables together, bay, b. What is that? That will tell you whether they can blend syllables or not. Um, but this counting piece, be careful not to continue working on syllable counting if they're tapping out the right number of syllables. Um, if they have syllable awareness, move on. Go to the phoneme level, the individual sound level, because that, every movement you make in terms of having the child gain the ability of blending and segmenting individual sounds and words, you're getting them closer and closer to being a proficient, down the line, a proficient reader, because that's the foundation that is absolutely necessary. It is the bridge between oral language and written language, is this ability to identify individual sounds and words and to blend them together when we give the sounds my word is m, mm, e. Can you put those together and tell me what that is? That is key to reading and spelling. And I've already mentioned that we don't need to be working on word awareness or sentence awareness. So let's start with syllable awareness. So lay, d, bug. Three syllables. Let's look more closely at that task. So the first issue is that educators will generally tell me that they're struggling to find a good way to sound out syllables. And they sometimes get stuck on the number of syllables in words. So I'm going to teach you a foolproof way. You have children close their mouth and say a word through closed lips. And in fact, the children will try to shout the word through closed lips. So we're going to do the word giraffe. We close our lips. And now through those closed lips, we're going to shout the word giraffe. So you go, mm -mm. by doing this, you automatically obtain the right number of syllables. There are other tricks. Some people will say, you say the word, and if your jaw drops, that represents a syllable. That one doesn't always work because there are some vowel sounds that your jaw doesn't drop. There's other people who look consider more the spelling of the word and keep track of that. Well, of course, that's not good for children in daycare who are not yet reading and writing. So I find that this way is really um, quite foolproof. 
and you can read more about it on the Reading Rockets website, and which is a great website for early literacy and learning about that. So the first thing is making sure you're counting the syllables correctly, and here's one way. Um, the next thing you would do is you would start talking about long versus short words with your students and children, and you would maybe make the activity engaging by showing them pictures, asking them to short, sort the pictures, or even better, the real objects of is this short, is this long. Maybe you have a fly swatter and you're having them swat the picture that represents something that has more syllables in the word. Maybe you have a small flashlight and you're having them shine a light on the object in the pair that has the most number of syllables. And these are all things that you can do to uh, work on syllable awareness. Be careful though, because for children, they're gonna be focused on the object. And so sometimes you'll find that children will tell you that train is a long word because a, a, the object, the train, can be long if there are several wagons. Um, and so we, we need to bring them back to, okay, but when I listen to the word train, that's just one. They could maybe be jumping through hula hoops for each syllable in the word so they can take turns. You line them up, give them a word. They hop the right number of syllables. If they don't get it correctly, you model it for them. Give them another word with the same number of syllables go on to the next child you can have baskets where they're sorting in this box it's going to or basket it's going to be all pictures of objects that when you say it there's only one syllable in this basket it's going to be all two syllable objects or pictures and in this basket three syllables when you find that children are struggling a lot with this you assign them to one syllable baskets Etc. So the, lots of things that you can do with syllables, but just watch it for that issue that sometimes comes up when the object itself is long, um, and and make sure to bring them back to what we're hearing. So we can ask them how many words, how many syllables in a word. We can have them clap. We can have them tap out the number of syllables on their arms. We can have them try to blend syllables, so I might give them, at the top left here, there's something called chipper chat. These are fantastic if you don't have them already. They're little plastic tokens, and there's a little metal ring around them, and you have this magic wand with a magnet in it. That's what this purple wand is, and you give them the chips so as you say the words. So you might say, eh, le, bent, and then you tell them it's their turn they say uh le bent and then you swoop it up with the magic wand elephant and you model this several times you do it for them until they're able to start doing it it might take a lot a lot a lot a lot of you modeling this and at first they won't know about syllables or simply mimicking you but they're still learning by doing that so you go ahead and do that as long as they are having fun doing it um, just be careful about the what you use to count syllables because I find that it's better to use one thing for syllables and then later when you're at the phoneme stage to use something else. So if you're clapping for syllables, I wouldn't clap for phonemes. So when it's time to go f, i, sh, I'm not going to do clapping. Rather, I might count on my fingers or I might use First phoneme is my hand, second phoneme is my elbow, third is my shoulder, fourth is my head, fifth is my other shoulder. Some people reserve that for syllables and they use fingers for phonemes. Just make sure you're not using the same system for both. Just a word of caution about that. Um, there's also these nifty little picture cards that exist. So. Um, what do you get if you have cook and keys? And if they say that, that quickly, they get cookies. So the idea is I do this with blocks. So I'll use two blocks and I'll say, listen, cook, 
keys. Cook, keys, and then I'll say it and I'll reduce the time in between those words, the space that I've left, and I'll, as I bring the blocks closer together. So cookies, cookies, cookies. And then they'll say cookies. No, yeah, I gave them the answer, but that's how they start picking up on this. So you model this a lot with some tangible two blocks, two erasers, two pencils, two of whatever, two tokens that you bring closer together as you're bringing the two parts of the word closer together. You can also do the same with two blocks and you say, okay, watch, this is pay per. What happens if I take away pay? What's left here? And this is how we're showing them about manipulating, removing, or adding syllables. So always some sort of a tangible, either your hands or blocks, or tokens, that's what's going to be helpful to them. Sometimes I've used cars, uh, that's fine too. Dinosaurs, whatever. Here's a little activity that you can do with the group with syllables. The most interesting thing ever for children is their own name. So it's a good place to start. Here, let's look at this little video. Very special tambourine. And do you know what I use my tambourine for? I use it to count up the beats I hear in names. Listen to how I count the beats in my name. This, this, and go. I hear four beats in my name. If we go around the circle, let's see how many beats you have in your name. Maya, can you count the beats in your name? Hi. Maya, how many beats did you hear in your name? Two. You heard two beats in your name. Maya. Aaron. Aaron. How many beats did you hear in your name? Two. two beats in your name. Can you pass it to Jordan, please? Jordan. Jordan, how many beats did you hear? Okay. So you get the idea. One way with musical instruments, it could have been sh shakers. Sorry. It, you could have used shakers or the tambourine, drumsticks, anything to count out those beats. And children generally love that. Here's another activity that you could do. I really like this one because this is something you do after reading a, a book. One idea for an activity, we have a suitcase here. And you can tell the children that you are going to pack your own suitcase for summer vacation. So when you open the suitcase, what we have divided into four different compartments. So there's one syllable, two syllable, three syllable, and four syllable. Based on some of the vocabulary from the book, uh, we have some visuals here. And you can start off with just having the visuals in a pile or perhaps in a little bag where the children can pick out one of the pictures, and then you can incorporate your phonological awareness uh, by selecting the picture, and then having the children say the word, break it up, and then blend it together. And then together you can select where the picture goes. So puzzle would go in the compartment where there's two syllables. So the idea is they would say puzzle, puzzle, and put it in the spot for the two-syllable words, which is a nice way to review vocabulary as well. Now, um, another syllable level activity is rhyme awareness. This is when we try to have children tell us whether two words rhyme. If you Google phonological awareness, you're going to see a lot about rhyming. What you need to know is that it's not necessary to work on rhyming. Some kids never figure it out. They're not able to generate words that rhyme. So if you say, tell me something that rhymes with cap, some children cannot do that. Or if you say, um, does cat and rat rhyme? Does it sound the same? 
that might say yes, they might say no, but they have one out of two chances of getting that right. And many find that difficult. Don't get stuck there. You can move on and it will do no harm. So rhymes are fun, rhymes are in songs, rhyme are, are an interesting thing to do, but don't get stuck at that phase of phonological awareness because it's not necessary. Children can do quite well and, and proceed to very high levels without having ever mastered the ability to tell you whether things rhyme. But if you were to work on rhyme, you, you might do that with some rhyming stories, with songs, with these rhyme puzzles where they fit together only if they do rhyme like cat and rat. These are the types of activities that one might do for that. Remember, we're trying to get here at this target of phonemic awareness, so individual sounds, and rhyming is a syllable awareness task, and it's the most difficult one for some children. It's easier for them to count syllables and to blend syllables together or to break apart syllables than it is to work with rhymes. So now we're at the good part, the phonemic awareness, and I've put our, the famous poppers that I'm sure a lot of your kids are bringing in from home, and they, these can be used to identify sounds in words. You know, you give them a word, they pop the right number of sounds, and you take turns doing that. So um, what's interesting to note is that though your children are in daycare, once our children can handle uh, talking about individual sounds in words, that's usually when we start bringing letters into the mix. So you're not going to go into letter sound instruction and start teaching kids to read and write. But you could be, when they're saying f, e, sh, you could be pulling out a magnetic letter F and saying yes, and that f you told me about, this is the letter that makes that sound. That's interesting to do. There's a lot of research showing that the phonological awareness, once they're at this phoneme level, they make even greater gains if you mix print into uh, the activity, the playful activity. Now, what's interesting to point out is that it is a good idea to start showing them the letters that go with these sounds that they're talking about without doing letter sound or literacy instruction formally. Phonological awareness is an auditory ability. So when you're teaching them, you can use the letters at some point in the activity. Um, so for example, after they've told you the first sound of that word, then you can show them that letter. But if you're seeing if they have acquired the ability to blend or to segment sounds and words, you should do it without print because that's the real proof of being able to do it is whether you can do that without print, okay? So you teach and you can show letters when you're teaching, but when you test to see where they're at and whether you can go on to say the consonant clusters, you're gonna do that without print. So um, one part that is phonemic awareness is um, alliteration tasks. So things like six silly snakes, the, all the words starting with the same sound, that's a type of phonemic awareness because we're having them focus in on one sound in the word. And so we could ask them whether two words start with the same sound. Do baby and boot start with the same sound? And again, they have one out of two chances of getting it right. So it might be a better idea to say baby, boot, and then see if they can fill in with a word that they know. Maybe they'll think of bottle, for example. This um, link here that I've added for you is a nice link from Hanin, which is an organization um, that does a lot of parent and educator training on, on language stimulation. They have something called the book nook, where they highlight certain books and they, um, they show how to proceed through a phonological awareness activity with a given book. And in this one book nook, they talk about the perfect pizza party repeat the cat. So this is all about alliteration of the sound P. So that's one way to start having children listen to for sounds in words. Um, 
Another phonemic awareness activity, so now alliteration was one example. Another one is just having children count the individual sounds and words. So how many sounds in dog? And we're modeling and using tangibles and breaking down d, a, g. So I have three tokens or three blocks and I'm sliding them one after the other to have children see what I'm doing. And as I say, initially, they don't understand it. They're just going to copy you, d, a, g. But that's okay. That's part of their learning. You can go ahead and let them do that. Um, there's this nice resource called uh, wordwall.net that has many activities um, for those of you who have in, in their preschool rooms the smart boards. So, um, you can use those or you can just have it on your own iPad and these are the words that you're giving them and the kinds of tasks. So I'll just show you quickly what that looks like. Here is what that looks like. So how many sounds? You start the activity and if you say the right answer, you get a little check mark. So you can do this as a group or you can just use it for yourself. Um, to have ready-made easy words at the drop of a hat. Let's just go back to our slides. Um, you can have an activity where you ask if the words start with the same sound. And again, there's a word wall resource that goes with this. Um, next, you can have them blend two sounds together. So listen carefully. I'm going to speak very slowly and you're gonna to try to guess what I'm saying. You could use a puppet for this. I've used puppets all the time, saying that my puppet, the rabbit, speaks really slowly. We have to listen carefully to see what he's trying to tell us. And then I'll say, mm, e. And I'll say, did you hear that? He said, mm, e. What's he trying to say? Mm, e. And then I'll have blocks and I'll bring them closer together, like I said before. So, mm, e. Me, me, and then the child will have heard me say me, and they'll say me, yes, good job. And I'll give another one. Oh, now he's saying s e, something very similar, and to have them do that. And so we're doing the consonant vowel, that, that's what that CV stands for. And then much more complex would be with the clusters, something like consonant, consonant, vowel, or um, so here we have blue, that if we say it orally, it's b, l, u. So it's consonant sound, consonant sound, vowel. In fact, I should have not put that final consonant there. There's an error, I'm gonna have to correct that. So this is super important because this putting sounds together is what we do when we read words. So down the line, we're preparing them for in a couple of years when they're gonna be reading you need that ability as a foundation. Here's an activity of um, blending sounds together without print and done in a classroom that I wanted to share with you. If you remember how to put that sound. Great, you should have your blue, your red, and your blue square in front of you because we're gonna start out with three letter words. I'm gonna show you how to do one on the board. If I say these sounds, huh, ah, uh, t, what word did I make? Us. Good. That's how you're gonna push your sounds. When you hear my sound, pull your sound down and say the word fast. The first word I say is ah, mm. Sam, who has a sense for Sam? Courtney, did you see Sam walk across the street? Great. Next word. Ah. Uh. Ah. Pot. The pot is boiling over. Now that we've done a. Children are older than yours probably, but you can do the same activity with younger children in smaller groups where you have, the, the what I wanted to show you is that she's only using these felt squares that the children are pushing. So it really doesn't matter what the, 
the manipulative is, as long as it's the same object, it can be a different color. In fact, it's probably preferable that it's a different color so that they don't um, think that this, the color also represents the exact same sound. And so you're having them essentially listen to a word and then say the whole, the sounds in the word and then say the whole word. Um, and then conversely, the breaking apart or the segmenting is something that we do when we spell, right? If you say to me, what's your family name? I tell you, Erdis, not an easy name to write. You're going to have to sound out what I just said. She said, Erdis. Er, d, uh, s. So segmenting is key for spelling. And so we're going to have kids do that. We're going to say, okay, the word is shoe. What sounds do we hear in shoe? And we're going to model, model, model. Shh, ooh, shh, ooh, shh, ooh. We're showing them and we're bringing our objects closer and closer together. That's how we work on segmenting. And then a very, very difficult level would be at, at age five only and, and maybe a bit beyond would be to have a constant cluster. My word is crab. What sounds do you hear in crab? And most children, when they start off, they will say k, a, b. They won't talk to you about their r sound. That second sound in a group of consonants is very hard for children to grasp. But if you start working on this early, you may have children who are still in daycare, maybe on their way out, but who, who are starting to do this. So that's segmenting, when you're breaking it apart. And I'd like to show you this video. Sit. Man. And again, man. Yeah, let's do mm, good. Let's do that whole up word again. Man. Mm. Mm. Good. Okay. Okay. Just a simple activity to show you how to use those poppers, right? So once the children understand the task. They can be using the poppers. They could be using a bingo stamper, m, mm, a, ah, n, mm, and all of the above are applicable. Whatever um, they get engaged in, essentially. Now, there is also these um, websites where you can have what's called Elkonen boxes with tokens and where you would give them a word and you're pushing up the token um, live with the children. So you could say, my word is me. What do we hear in me? So maybe one child says, mm. so you're going to take, I can't do it now because these aren't movable, but I would take my cursor and move the token into the first box. Mm, that's right. And what's the, what do we hear after? Mm? And someone says, e, great. You move it up. And then as you're touching with your cursor, the first token and the second token you're making the sound so that's another activity and if you have a touch screen even better the kids come and they're moving up the token themselves and manipulating them as they're saying the word that's how we get children to be able to start playing with sounds that they hear first we're doing it with some sort of a visual or tangible that they're manipulating this is a another and by the way on this slide the website is uh, embedded right here where it says Elkonen boxes if you click here and i will be sending you the slides you will have access to this free resource then there's this one from really great reading also a free resource where you get something that looks like this and essentially you can drag down um, the colored tiles so you can ignore the letters, they're just part of what shows up, but you're only going to be playing with these colored tiles and you're going to say my word is fish and you're going to model and pull down the red box and say 
pull down the yellow box and say it, pull down the green box and say shh. And again, this is how kids start to understand, okay, she's talking or he's talking about those little parts. Because at first they look at you like you have two heads. They don't know what it is that you're breaking down when you're talking about those parts. And it's by doing it enough that they start to understand. So this is another resource. And now the next problem that arises, and this is very tricky. I'm a speech language pathologist, so I, I learned this and it's been drilled into me. But um, if you're an educator, you may not even be sure what the sounds are in the word because it's not something that we intuitively do. I have many, many educator and teacher colleagues who are unable to do this and they're brilliant people. So there's this nice resource that exists called the word mapping tool and they, it's embedded in this link here where you can check. So you type in a word where it says word mapping and then it tells you how many sounds there are and what those sounds are. So the second layer here tells you it's, the word is enough. So you have e, n, a, f. And that's how you know what the phonemes are because that's much easier said than done if you're trying to do it on your own and, and you haven't done this, you will struggle identifying those phonemes. So rest assured, you have uh, this little resource to help you along. So the gist of things is you're trying to get to the phoneme level as quickly as you can, the individual sounds in words that you're trying to get students to blend and to segment. And this is gonna be your progression. You're gonna start with consonant vowel kind of words or vowel consonant kind of words. And that would be a word like C, because if I say it orally, I'm hearing S, consonant sound, E, vowel sound. So you're starting with CV, then you're going to CVC, that's a word like fish. Then if they can do that, you're going to CCVC, the, the tricky words with the clusters. That's your progression. You're starting this with blending. And when they can blend CV, now you have them segment CV. Then you're gonna have them blend CVC kind of words. And then you're going to have them segment CVC kind of words. So I hope that's clear. Maybe um, you'll let me know in the question period if you have any questions about that. So we're not talking about print. We're talking orally. But we did say that when you're at the individual phoneme level, if you've made it past and you, you can check off that they know how to blend and to segment syllables, now you're going to be going into phonemes and you can start showing those letters um, by either writing them yourself or having magnetic letters to show. What's interesting is that phonological awareness is kind of like your knowledge of something. It cuts across languages. So you can do this in French, you can do this in English, you can do this in Urdu, and it's still gonna be helpful. You're still building phonological awareness skills. So I'm not gonna show this video because I did show it in uh, the previous webinar, um, but if you wanna see what this looks like when you use different languages, you can go ahead and click on the link once you get the slides. And the idea is that I'm doing a phonological awareness game with the class and maybe they're, they're counting out syllables. And I'll say, Tommy, um, how many syllables in banana? And Tommy says, banana. Good job. And then I say, Madeline, ton mot c'est giraffe. Tell me the, the, how many syllables in giraffe? And she'll go, giraffe. Perfect. I've given her a French word. And then maybe I have a child who speaks Hungarian. And I'll say, Thomas, your word is piroche. How many syllables in pihosh? And he says pihosh. And that's beautiful because we're sending the message, number one, that it's great for you to know words in other languages. They're gonna get excited if they hear a word in their own language. We're also sending the message that it's the same thing. A word is a word, whether it's in Hungarian, in French, or in English. We're counting syllables or we're counting phonemes. So go ahead and mix languages like that not having full-on conversations in the other language, 
But if you can find out one or two words in that language and use them in your activity, you're going to get even more engagement. And that's a good thing. You're building phonological awareness skills. Um, so how can we make these things clearer for kids who don't get it? The ones who look at you like you have two heads. Well, you can tap, you can use gestures, you can emphasize with your voice by stretching sounds out. You can use analogies, talking like a robot when you're segmenting syllables. Um, you can be using scissors to cut a picture of lady bug into three parts. But be careful though, because lay, one cut, D, two cuts, bug, three cuts, but that'll give you four parts if you've cut three times. So watch with the cutting that you have the right number of pieces. Um, you can be gluing things with tape to show that you're blending together, baby. I'm gonna put some tape, baby, and, and show it this way you're going to use blocks and other tangibles. Here's a nice video if you have parents who are, who are hearing their child, you know, do these things and talk about sounds and words at home and they, they want to learn about phonemic awareness. Here's a nice video for them about how to work on phonemic awareness of act with blocks, etc. cetera. Um, this is something you could share. It was created for parents. It was created during the pandemic. Um, so that could be fun. Now, in terms of activities, there are tons of activities out there. So my remaining slides are all activities. We have, for example, morning time. You can, a child talks to you about going grocery shopping with their dad, and you can say, oh, that's really interesting. And now, children, do you know what sound we hear in the word shopping? You can just highlight a given word. You add story time when there is a story about a fox. You can ask them what sounds they hear in the word fox. When you're doing a craft, you could talk about a sound in a word that your craft is about. You can use children's names um, to get them to be allowed to go to a certain corner of the classroom. So you can say, I'm going to call who will be going to the kitchen corner. Okay. Ah, mm, e. If they're at the phoneme level, if they're at the syllable level, I'm calling ta me. Who is that? And now they have to put the syllables together. Um, having them guess what today is by segmenting the day of the week. Um, asking them about words that rhyme during a holiday activity. Having them do a kind of Simon Says. I want you to touch your n o's. What is that? What are we going to touch when I say touch your n o's? Um, you can have songs, you can have um, words that you use to talk about upcoming parts of the day. Now it is time for lunch, if, if they need bigger chunks of words. If they're at the phoneme level, you say lunch. What are we doing now? And because they know what's coming up next, they will guess it correctly. That'll build their self-esteem, even though they're not yet able to blend, you're getting them to participate in a blending activity. You can have memory games um, where children uh, are taking turns, picking a picture, and then sorting the picture according to its first sound or according to its number of syllables. You can have a special playhouse where in this playhouse we're only putting things that have a certain sound at the beginning of the word. Um, you can do treasure hunts where they're, they're looking for objects that have a certain sound in the word. I have more activities here of frog races where you advance the number of syllables in the word of the object that you picked out of a bag or of the picture that you picked out of a bag. You can have a giant snakes and ladders game and they advance the right number of syllables. Um, you can have, what else, what else, what else, I've mentioned some of these already, some with Play-Doh, if they're creating a Play-Doh snake, for example, you have them um, chop it up, the number of syllables from a given word, so now I'm looking for the number of chops you would need 
for bicycle. So they have to go chop, chop to have three parts, bicycle. Um, what else? Silly sentences for the alliteration. Thumbs up if you hear at the beginning of this word. The list goes on. There are lots of activities here. Um, and I'm sure you you can list some that you're already doing yourselves. I wanted to share with you some websites here that all have phonemic awareness activities. So there's the Abra Cadabra that is for three years and up, where you can get a lot of great ideas for phonological awareness activities. There's one great activity, it's a monster, and you feed the monster popsicles, the number of popsicles that correspond to the number of syllables. There is the Florida Center for Reading Research. So this, this last link is all songs about phonological awareness. Great way to engage children and to get them to start listening to sounds. So there's a lot out there. And I hope that I've given you the key information for you to know what is extra fluff and what is the core stuff that will make a huge difference if, if you can get the kids there. Uh, hopefully, we've done that tonight. And I think. That is all the time that I have. These are some references, and this is my email if, if you have specific questions or needs that you would like to chat about. Thank you, Carolyn. That was amazing. There's just so many um, practical things that we can apply right to practice tomorrow, so it's, it's very exciting to see. And also to, to clarify some of the the definitions and the approaches to use because it can be quite overwhelming but I think you did a great job in, in giving us an opportunity to understand it at a, a level that's really practical for early childhood educators so thank you for that um, and like I said in the in the questions here you will all be receiving the slides so don't worry about that though the slides will be sent with the follow-up email with all of the links and additional resources and those great activities those practical activities that Carolyn pointed out there's a question here that I could um, throw over to you just uh, before we sign off Someone would like to know if phonemic awareness happens after the kids are fully aware of all the phonics sounds of the alphabet. No. Um, it, phonemic awareness is what comes before. Because as I said, once they're at the stage where they can hear the individual sounds, and they're, they're showing that to you by you saying m e and they say me, now they're ready to learn the phonics, which is the letter that goes with that sound. The phonics part is the letter part, the visual letter the, that we write. And that comes after, once they've shown us that they hear individual sounds. And in fact, if you try to do the opposite and you try to teach them letter sounds, often it doesn't stick because they don't understand these pieces of words yet. It's those two things together that make it click and now they're they're starting to have the early precursors to reading. So first the phonological awareness, then the phonics when they're at the individual sound level. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just looking through to see. Um, someone's asking. So how important is phonological awareness for infants and toddlers, and how can I incorporate phonological awareness with this age group? That's my mm -hmm. So for the young, young ones, I would go with the signs because yeah. most, as I said, it's around age three that you can start clapping out syllables. You can try with the two-year-olds as well. Some of your two-year-olds will. You know, you're going to say, daddy, give them the drumsticks and they'll go, daddy. And then the other child, you, you give them, you know, um, baby and they'll go, baby. And they can imitate, but whether they will grasp about blending and segmenting that's probably closer to age three, but the songs, the rhyming books, the hop on pop, Dr. Seuss, all of those things rich in wordplay are setting the stage for that. So go ahead and do that, and that's time well spent. Great. Well, I think that that's really the, the big takeaway for this, for a lot of practitioners, is a lot of the stuff that you are already doing is really 
preparing children for their phonological awareness. So just keep on doing what you're doing. And with these additional activities, uh, now you can feel really empowered and do it with intention. So thank you very much, Carolyn, for giving us this opportunity to learn more about phonological awareness. And I know you guys are probably really excited to be getting the follow-up email with all of the additional resources. So be looking forward to that within the next few days. So give us a couple of days to get that sorted and we will be sending you um, all of the information, resources, slides, and certificates will be coming as well. And the certificates come in a separate email. So there'll be two separate emails coming, one a follow-up and then one um, with the certificate. And thanks again to you, Carolyn, for, for giving us this wonderful opportunity to learn more about phonological awareness. And thank you everyone for participating and joining us tonight. I know it's sometimes difficult in the evening to come after a long day of work, but it's just so valuable and this information is just so important. So thanks for for joining us and thanks to Wintergreen Learning Materials as well for helping support this, this live learning event. Thank you very much and have a good evening everyone. Thank Bye. you everyone, have a good evening.